Welcome to another Holy Troublemakers and Unconventional Saints online story time. This is our eighth one, and you can find all of the other seven story times on our YouTube channel. Thanks to enough of you and your adults subscribing, we have our own dedicated URL now. It's youtube.com slash holy troublemakers, and you can find all the stories there. Today, we are going to read a story that is really special to me. Um, it is a story, especially because next week starts Pride Month. And I'm going to talk about what Pride is in just a minute, in case um, some of you don't know. But we are going to read Jennifer Knapp's story today. And I am super excited to say that at the end of my reading, we are going to get to call her and talk to her a little bit live. So that is um, really fun whenever some of the modern day people featured in the book can join in with these story times. Um, all of these stories are about people of faith, different types of faith, who have worked for love and justice in the world. They're the sort of people that inspire me and the sort of people I wanted my own children to be inspired by. So that's what all these stories are about. And for um, Pride Month, you might want to go through and read especially some of the stories that feature LGBTQ people. So LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And um, gay and lesbian just means that somebody can fall in love with somebody of the same gender. So a woman might fall in love with a woman or a man with a man. Um, bisexual simply means you can fall in love with somebody of either of those genders or somebody who's non-binary, um, doesn't necessarily identify um, strictly as male or female. Transgender is somebody whose mind, which is where we get our gender identity, tells them that they are a gender other than what um, you know the doctors and their parents might have thought when they were born. So the majority of people are what we call cisgender. I am cisgender. Um, my body appears to look female, and that's what I was identified when I was born, is as a female baby girl. And my mind also identifies that way. And sometimes, um, it crosses over, and that's what trans means, is the opposite side. So sometimes people are transgender. And there are a lot of LGBTQ stories in this book precisely because those are stories that have been so often left out of religious and faith narratives. And so a few of the people that you might want to read about um, this month for Pride would be somebody like Bayard Rustin. He's really one of the patron saints of this entire concept of this book. Um, Broderick Greer, he is an Episcopal priest in Denver. Glennon Doyle, she just wrote a new book um, that some of the adults in your life might be reading called Untamed. Erwin Keller, who is a rabbi up in the San Francisco area. Leslie Foster, who was one of the story times that we already did a couple of weeks ago, and he was able to join in for a live phone call too at the end. So if you haven't seen that one yet, recommend that one. Um, Lizbeth Melendez Rivera. Um, and what's interesting is her artwork was done by the same artwork as Mad uh, artist that did Madia Lin. Uh, Madia Lin is a um, Muslim leader in Chicago who leads a fully LGBT inclusive mosque in Chicago. Mary Oliver, the poet with her beautiful, beautiful poems. Many people don't know that her longtime partner was a woman. Maria Mulcara, an incredible story about a transgender rights activist from Iran. Uh, Megan Rohrer, a reverend in the San Francisco area who is the first openly transgender person to be ordained in the Lutheran Church. Paula Stone Williams, who um, also is uh, transgender, and um, I just absolutely, this artwork is incredible. And Jennifer Knapp, who we're going to read about today. Her artwork was also done by an artist named Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer Bloomer. There are no relation, but um, same first name. And 
really quickly before I read the story, I want to talk to you about what pride is. So pride is celebrated every summer. Um, it used to just be June, but now it sometimes spreads out through the summer months. And if you see this flag somewhere or a variation of it, it's a pride flag. And pride began because not that long ago, people who were gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender were incredibly discriminated against. It's, there's still a lot of that today, actually, but compared to where it was 50 years ago, um, it was very, very difficult then to be open um, if you were a gay person. And there was a couple of places where it was often bars and places where people could go to be safe. And one of those places was called the Stonewall Inn in New York City. Um, you can visit it still today when we can all travel again. Uh, it's in the part of New York known as Greenwich Village. And that was a bar that was known to be safe for LGBT people, even though it was technically against the law to actually have an employee who was gay. Um, you could get um, fired or put in jail for um, even being open about who you were at the time. And one day in June, the police raided the Stonewall Inn. And that had happened many times before, but for different reasons on that particular day, and it actually became a series of days, um, the patrons inside decided they were tired of being pushed around and being treated unfairly simply because of who they were. And um, they clashed with the police. There was a series of riots. Uh, remarkably, nobody was uh, seriously injured. Um, and this became the birth of the modern LGBT rights movement. And a couple years later in San Francisco, one of the major um, leaders named Harvey Milk, who became the first openly gay politician ever, uh, well, one of the first ever elected to public office um, in San Francisco, talked with a flag designer and artist named Gilbert Baker, who was also um, living there. And they came up with this flag. They knew they needed a symbol, something um, that represented them. The only symbol that had been used so far was actually a derogatory symbol that Hitler had used um, during the Second World War because gay people were also put into concentration camps. And um, they didn't want a symbol that had been a sign of discrimination or hate like that. And so Gilbert Baker came up with this design and you'll probably recognize it as a sign that you see in the sky all the time, um, especially um, depending on where you live, uh, if it rains a lot, it's a rainbow. And the rainbow flag is meant to represent the incredible, beautiful diversity of the LGBTQ community and also the unity, even though there's so much diversity. And it's a sign of hope. Um, the artist said he knew that people needed hope and this is, uh, all sorts of cultures of the world have stories about the rainbow that um, that we, and you might be familiar with the one from the Hebrew Bible, what the Christians call the Old Testament, as at the end of the flood story that's there, there's a rainbow put in the sky as a sign of hope and a promise. And so this became the symbol, and it's still used today, for pride, pride in who you are, not being ashamed of who you are. So many LGBT people um, especially at that time, 50 years ago, had been raised to think that there was something wrong with them and they felt shame. And so pride is about not being ashamed, um, being a place where you can be celebrated for exactly who you are. Often there is a huge parade. That's a lot of fun. Um, it, uh, it varies. It's now celebrated all over the world. So this year, because of COVID-19, most of the pride parades, I mean, all of the ones at this point that are scheduled for the summer are canceled. And so some of the ways that we can celebrate pride, which um, people who are not LGBTQ themselves, but want to support LGBTQ people and affirm that we all matter and that everybody should be treated fairly. Um, we can celebrate pride with maybe putting out flower bouquets. My older daughter, Lily, put this one together from some flowers she collected from the yard. Rainbow flowers. We have some rocks, and she painted a rock 
I don't know if some of you have seen rocks where people will leave for you to find later. And this one has a little rainbow and it says, love always wins. And on the back, she put hashtag pride. <laughs> so we are thinking for our June family, you know, random act of kindness. Um, there's some places that we can, that we can walk and we'll hide some of these little, um, rainbow rocks somewhere for somebody to come find later. And we hope that will spread a little love and good cheer. There's a lot of books you can read. I will post a link um, in the description of the YouTube video of a list of some great LGBTQ kids books that you can read to celebrate. There's all these other profiles in Holy Troublemakers. And I just have to show you, there's even pride flags, little <laughs> handkerchiefs here for dogs. This is our dog, Nixie, showing her pride. <laughs> Good girl. All right, so with that as an I background um, for Pride Month, I'm gonna read Jennifer Knapp's profile. This book is a special copy to me because Jennifer has actually signed it. It's a Sunday morning in Chanute, Kansas. An eight-year-old girl named Jennifer Knapp sits on a pew inside a simple church with her sister and grandparents. The nylons her grandma makes her wear under her dress are itchy, hot, and uncomfortable. Her feet feel pinched inside of the dress shoes she has to wear to church. She shifts in her seat, trying to get comfortable. I used to have to dress like that in church when I was a 10-year-old too, and, oh, sorry, eight-year-old. 10 and eight for me, and it was very uncomfortable. Shh. Jennifer grandmother shushes her and gives her a stern look. Jennifer tries harder to sit still. The preacher is talking about Jesus. Jennifer likes these stories and she loves visiting her grandparents, but going to church where she gets told that she has to act like a lady isn't her favorite thing. Who decided that ladies are supposed to wear uncomfortable clothes and sit still anyway? Jennifer looks out the window at the front of the church, trying to catch a glimpse of the world outside. She wishes she could be out digging up crawdads at the creek, playing in the dirt, or riding her bike. Outside is where she feels the happiest, and outside is where she feels the spirit of God that the preacher keeps droning on about. Outside is where she can be herself. Besides loving nature and being outside, Jennifer loves music. Her teachers start to notice that she has a gift and encourage her to play more music. She starts by learning to play the recorder, then she adds piano, and by high school she also plays the trumpet. She is such a good trumpet player that she receives a scholarship to college to play it. In college, Jennifer committed her life to God in a way that she hadn't before. She had struggled with making safe choices after leaving home. She and her friends abused alcohol and made other choices that she later regretted. But at one point in college, her friend reminded Jennifer of how precious and valuable she was to God. Jennifer began to treat herself with more kindness as she imagined God might treat her. That led her to making healthier choices and focusing more on her spiritual life. Jennifer's musical skills led her to learn the guitar before long, she was leading praise music worship teams in college and singing christian theme songs in the local cafes. She produced two albums that got the notice of a record label known for finding new and promising talent. In 1997, her record, Kansas, came out. It was a huge hit in the Christian music world. Her honest lyrics and alternative folk sound made her popular even beyond the Christian music world. Soon she was on tour most of the year, playing her music in front of huge crowds, along with other popular Christian music artists. She won more awards, and her managers wanted, to produce, wanted her to produce more records and to book more tours. But the Christian music world wasn't ever an easy fit for Jennifer. The managers, record labels, radio stations, concert halls, and Christian bookstores, where a lot of her music was sold, had very strict expectations. In many ways, it was the adult version of what I had experienced as an eight-year-old girl in church, Jennifer says. There were lots of rules about what 
good Christian girls could or couldn't do. Jennifer understood that the authority figures in the Christian music world wanted her to write mainly happy songs about God. But the way Jennifer talked about her faith was always a little bit different. Jennifer's music didn't fit the usual expectations of the Christian music world. Her lyrics were often raw and real, her music uh, showing her commitment to honesty and truth. And the truth about faith is that it isn't always happy or easy. Just like her yearnings to be outside feeling the spirit of God in nature instead of inside of a church with stained glass windows and crosses, Jennifer's instincts as a musician were outside of the four walls of any church. I kept breaking the boundaries of where we find God, Jennifer says. As an artist, I never fit the mold. In 2002, the exhaustion of being on tour for 250 days a year and the presence uh, and the pressures of the Christian music industry to write a certain type of music got to Jennifer. She knew she had to step back or she was going to lose her sense of who she really was. She told her managers that she was going to Australia to take a break. When will you be back? They asked, worried about how to see keep selling her music. I don't know, Jennifer replied simply. I need a break. In Australia, Jennifer finally found a quiet space to think. There was something else that Jennifer had started to realize that she knew would not go over well in the Christian music world. Jennifer was in love with a woman. Could she be both a person of faith and a lesbian? Did she have more music to write? Jennifer stayed in Australia for seven years. She stopped writing music for most of that time. She stopped doing things that she had been expected to do by other people. I threw out the baby with the bathwater, she says. I had to reclaim my own voice and rebuild everything. In the outback of Australia, that's a vast, vast inner part of Australia where there's not many people. In the outback of Australia, under a hot sun with kangaroos occasionally hopping by, Jennifer found the voice of God that had started to be drowned out by the voices of other people's expectations. I realized that God didn't expect me to be like everyone else. That opened me up to be able to talk about God with people again. Gradually, Jennifer began writing music again. She hadn't played her guitar in so long that it hurt her fingers to play chords, but she kept at it. Jennifer planned to tell her fans that she was in a committed relationship with the woman that she loved deeply. She also knew that being honest about being both a lesbian and a person of faith would come with huge losses in the Christian music world. Her career as a musician might be over. Too many, too many Christians had prejudices against LGBTQ people. But Jennifer knew that a lot of that prejudice came from ignorance and from not knowing actual LGBTQ people. Because so many people knew who Jennifer was, she felt like she had a chance to start conversations. She went on national television to talk about being a Christian and a lesbian. Jennifer wasn't wrong about how the Christian music world would receive her new record and the news that she was in a committed relationship with a woman. Most Christian radio stations banned her music. Former fans posted online that they deleted her songs from all of their devices. Jennifer essentially had to start over building a new fan base. Of course, some people also came to her concerts to thank her for her honesty because they too were people of faith and also part of the LGBTQ community. Seeing someone like Jennifer being honest gave others hope and energy. I came back to help all of the other LGBTQ kids out there know that these things are survivable, Jennifer says. In addition to releasing another album, Jennifer went to Divinity School and began a nonprofit called Inside Out Faith to help share the stories of LGBTQ people of faith. She wants to help challenge the conversation so that people realize that within all faith traditions, there are LGBTQ people. There are actually many LGBTQ people of faith who are thriving and teaching the rest of the church about love and justice. We want to show what it means to love without exception, she says. Even Jennifer is a bit surprised by how tenacious her faith turned out to be. Tenacious is a great word. If you're not familiar with it, it means uh, that hangs on, doesn't give up, doesn't let go. 
Even Jennifer is a bit surprised by how tenacious her faith turned out to be. It would have been a lot easier to entirely walk away from being a Christian. My choice to keep turning towards God can still be a bit hard to explain, Jennifer says, but here I am. And the prompt is, what does it mean to you to love without exception? That's a great, great one to think about, talk about, maybe journal about. What does it mean to love without exception? That reminds me a lot, actually, of Mr. Rogers, um, who was also, I think it was the second online story time we did, this idea that um, love is always accepting people exactly as they are. If we're trying to change them, um, that's not love. So I think that's a, those two might go well together. What, what does it mean to love without exception? I thought I would play you a quick song um, from Jennifer before we call her. And um, parents, you could definitely look up some of her music. She's, uh, she's got a lot of, of albums that are out. Um, these are not even all of them. And uh, this one is a collaboration with another musician that's an incredible um, Christmas album. Uh, my daughter's favorite album at the moment is this one, Letting Go, and a song called Dive In. So I thought I'd play you just a snippet of that so that you can um, hear some of her voice before uh, so you just know what I'm talking about a little bit. And parents, you absolutely uh, should help your kids go online and listen. If you find the Jennifer Knapp YouTube channel, you can find a bunch of her music, including some of her early music and her um, current music. That's just a snippet. I hope you go online and hear all of it. That one was from Dive In. And now we are gonna call Jennifer Knapp. So, one second. Hello, this is Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer, it's Deneen. Hey, Deneen. I am so grateful that you're taking the time to chat with us today. We are filming the Holy Troublemakers story time where I just finished reading your profile. Lovely. <laughs> and uh, I played him a little clip of my older daughter Lily's favorite song too, which at the moment is Dive In, but um, it does change from depending which CD she's listening to right now. <laughs> Well, that's lovely. I wanted to just check in and see how you were doing. You know, these are strange days for all of us with COVID-19. Yeah, you know, we stopped counting our lockdown about uh, around days, well, on Memorial Day. We've been doing food or posting our evening meal every night, and we've been doing a count. So we were into the 70s, and on Memorial Day, we were a little bit petite. <laughs> We stopped counting, but um, yeah, we've, you know, but we've been handling it. It's, it's not too, it hasn't been too bad, and I've got a nice, lovely, you know, little green backyard, so I've spent some time out there and uh, and have been communicating with people over, over FaceTime and Zoom and Skype and things like that, so it hasn't been too hard, but, the, you know, the lack of human contact has been a little bit lonely. Yeah, I, uh, I hear you on that. I have been uh, 
reading a couple historical biographies lately that have reminded me that humans have had to deal with things like this quite frequently, but we've gotten a little out of practice, actually, thanks to good public health and vaccines and sanitation and things like that. But I think we're getting a reminder about how viruses work and epidemiology 101. Yes, and a good reminder about how how much strangely, like when you go out, how how many people touch a doorknob. Yes. <laughs> things like that that re- remind me to just actually, that washing my hands is a really, really good thing to do. And yeah, you know, like yesterday I had to go out to the city for some for some things that I had to do, and I hadn't had that kind of contact inside of a building that wasn't my own home mm. um, in over two months. I hadn't been inside another building, which was the first time I'd really thought about that, and just realizing how many people have to share that space and yeah. the awareness that everyone has and how courteous we need to kind of be in order to just think about not only our own safety, but the safety of other people, too. So it was yes. it was really nice to see that people were, were being quite conscientious about it, but how how easily we can kind of just forget and just you know like I asked to go into an elevator when somebody else was in there like do you mind if I come in and they're like no so it's just you know a strange social interaction for sure yes I've definitely noticed when uh, we've watched a movie and people are doing close contact things I actually find myself sort of worrying for them and then I realize well oh this is (laughs) different this is before (laughs) (laughs) I know uh, my children are washing their hands more than they ever have. I'm sure all the kids watching this are washing their hands more than they ever have. So that might not be a terrible habit to continue forward. No, it's a very good habit to have. I, uh, as a musician um, who generally gathers people together to create a space that tends to you know, happen with the energy of people in a room together, how are you handling some of these changes that, that might last for a while? How are you trying to innovate how you work as a, as a creative person? Yeah, um, well, certainly, you know, for the, likely the rest of this year, and as soon as this kind of thing kind of went off, I pretty much just got myself in the mindset that concerts were not going to happen at, at all for about, you know, six to eight months. Um, And so just, I'm really fortunate because I have been doing online concerts for three or four years now. Mm. I started doing that when I wasn't touring a lot when I was in uh, working on my master's degree. So it was a way that I was using already because I knew that I couldn't go out and do live shows. And so because of that, like the the people that I hang out with, we kind of have like this live concert venue online which That's has been great. really helpful. Yeah, it's been really helpful because we there's a group of us who kind of already know knew how that worked, um, and we've been already practicing that before we kind of yeah. had to do it, yeah. which was really, really helpful. But one of the things that, that happens with that, of course, is like at a live show, you're – you can see the facial expressions yeah. and we ha- we're having a rolling conversation. Um, when I go and, and when you have the digital format, when you're looking at your computer screen, first off, you can't see everybody's faces. I can only, they, most people can only see mine. Right. So that, that leaves a little bit of work for me. But one of the things that we did recently was we were using, um, a different, we were de- doing a Facebook live. Yes. And Instagram Live, which has like a rolling feed of the conversations, and it's a little bit more interactive, so you can see what people are thinking. Now, that gets really hard <laughs> yeah. for, for me to read the scrolls of like 600 random people like trying to talk, so I don't see everything. But what it does do, especially like strangely, I would have never said this in a million years, but all the hearts and the smiles and the things that whenever you're watching a live video, you tap on those things, it, it really does make a difference. It's, it's a emoji energy. It is emoji energy. And it, it's like applause that it's a different kind of applause that you can hear. And it, it's not that it makes me feel better, but it, it lets me know that it's the music that I'm creating, the words that I'm saying are actually connecting in ways, which, you know, in a social situation, you get that from body language, from from people talking and interacting with you. But when you don't get the body language and you don't get the verbal, the the verbal communication, then emojis are a pretty good substitute, (laughs) at least for a little while. 
Well, I can guarantee you that the kids who watch these story times are expert emoji users, so that's great. So keep it up when uh, they're, you know, talking to their teachers and stuff like that. Give a little good energy back. Um, one of the reasons why I read your profile today is that next week starts Pride. And I explained a little bit in the intro uh, about Pride, and I was wondering if you could tell me, um, and the kids watching, what Pride means to you and why you think it matters so much. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think the, really the thing that I think about most is, the, the first word that comes to my mind is visibility. Mm. The, there, there's when you when we go and when we see the rest of the world, right? When we watch television, when we read books, so much of that has you know kind of traditional families like mom and dad, mm -hmm. and you know grandma and grandpa, like you know male and female relationships. We don't get to see a lot of same sex couples mm -hmm. and a lot of other intimate relationships and a lot of other families because they're just not as prolific mm -hmm. they're just not not as many of us so i think the importance of pride to me is that one time of year it's a season of which we kind of stop and take a second and remember the amazing people that live in our neighborhoods and our communities and our families that we don't often see and we don't often talk about um just because they're just in, just in terms of numbers, we're just not that many. Um, we're almost rare compared to <laughs> how you know how how many you know opposite sex couples and partners and families that you see. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. It, but it's actually not that rare. When you start to actually notice how many people in your community, you start to you know, and we have these moments like this in Pride Month. You start to notice the little things that give you an indicator that that there's somebody who's LGBTQ around, like rainbow flags, you start to realize that there are, you know, a, there's a, at least one family probably in your church, at least one family in your neighborhood, you know, in any given time when you go into the store, there's a family, you know, that's shopping right alongside you. Um, it's just kind of in the day-to-day -day operations of our lives, we sometimes take those things for granted. And for a long time, and this is, to me is one of the most important things about that visibility and why that visibility is so important, is for a long time, that wasn't allowed. We yeah. looked so poorly on that, and we didn't understand it. And we, you know, we got mad and angry and rejected other people who were falling in love with people who are, you know, girls falling in love with girls, boys falling in love with boys. We didn't understand it. We got mad and angry at it, and we rejected those people. We shut those stories down. Yeah. And when we don't hear what life is like for somebody, like, you know, like myself, I'm normal. <laughs> I'm actually really normal. I get up. I, go, I put on my clothes. I go to work. I read books. You know, I, I dream. I play music. There's nothing unusual really about me except for that the person that I spend my life with happens to be of the same gender that I am. And that gets really, you know... When we start to see the stories of that and we start to see the extraordinary lives of LGBTQ people, it starts to demystify it. It stops, mm -hmm. it, start, it stops being scary because we're different. You start to see, oh, that person's just like me. Yeah. That person does a lot of the things and, and cares for a lot of the things and is entertained and is moved and needs a lot of the same things that I need wow, you know, this person is not so alien. They're not so different that I can't find a way to see what makes them beautiful and what makes them lovely. Um, and I, so that, that to me is the part of the history behind why we see Pride Month is because for a long time we were scared yeah. to be ourselves in public and we were, we maybe were legitimately going to be in trouble for for the kinds of people that we are mm -hmm. and now with pride we start seeing that that's really not about a kind of person at all um we're ordinary people and that love is incredibly you know there's just really is a rainbow of the kinds of loves that we have in our lives yeah we you know we love across gender we love across countries across race across ethnicities there's so many ways that we can give our love and pride month is just as become not just a struggle um for people 
you know, a protest for people to be heard and to be seen, but it's actually through the many years that, that Pride has become more of a, a visible thing, it's become a celebration of all the unique ways that we love one another. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. We, uh, we, uh, we're going to be putting out, um, my eldest has been painting some rainbow rocks. That is going to be our little pride thing since we can't have a parade this June, but we're going to leave it in little spots where we know people walk in our community to leave some, some oh. love around. <laughs> As an LGBTQ person, if I were walking down the street and I just saw Rainbow Rock, I would know that somebody was thinking about me. Awesome. And that's pretty that's, cool. That's the hope. Hey, thank you so much for joining in today. This is so special. And uh, just really thank you. Well, thank you guys so much. And I'm super excited about all the stories that you're reading. There's so many cool people in there that have inspired me. And it is an honor and a privilege that you would get to read my story in there as well. You are one of our favorites. Thank you so much. All right. Love you guys. Love you too. Bye. That was so special. Uh, So Jennifer Knapp and um, any ideas that you have to show some love in your community and let people know that they're seen, they're loved um, and yourself too. What can we do for that? So let's, let's think about that um, for pride. And uh, I'm going to close this out with a song um, from Jennifer that was the very first song that I fell in love with. It's one of her early, early songs. And um, it's, uh, I'll just play a little. It's a beautiful version of Jesus Loves Me. It's hard to stop. It's so beautiful. That's a snippet. You can find the rest if you go looking for her music with your adult. So thank you so much for being here. I always love hearing from you. Um, You can find my contact form at holytroublemakers.com. Just click contact and those emails come right to me. So thanks to those of you who write in, who watch, who engage, who are trying to make some beautiful holy trouble in your community. Much love.